Hi. Hello. We have some people slowly joining us. Patrick, hello. And Bettina. Hi, Dr. Rosenbaum, how are you? Oh, good. And Ala, welcome. And Bruce, hi, Bruce. How are you? Didn't we meet in Brooklyn years ago, a few years ago? Bruce, I can't hear you. You're on mute. You got to unmute yourself. Still can't try, hear you. try that again. I'm unmuted. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I retired three years ago, Harold, from Brooklyn, right. but still live in Brooklyn. Okay, great. I remember how cordial you were showing me around the music department there of Brooklyn College. Nancy, do I know you? Well, I am from Brooklyn, but we've never met. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> welcome, everyone. Well, let me get my uh, welcome spiel over with while we uh, are waiting on some final people to join us. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight on this very snowy uh, week we're having here. Tonight, Harold is going to be talking about Box Christmas Oratorio. Um, this is just a really wonderful masterpiece. I'm very excited that we are all here tonight. Uh, since we are a large group in these sessions, we have put everyone on mute just to avoid any extra feedback um, or background noise. If you need to unmute yourself and communicate with a question or answer a question, please feel free to unmute yourself. You can hold down the space bar while you're speaking. That will automatically unmute yourself. Uh, and when you release, you'll go back on mute, or you can use the icon, the microphone icon in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Just remember to put yourself back on mute when you're done. There will be a live Q&A uh, at the end of the session. It's open to everyone, uh, new and old attendees alike. If you have any questions from throughout the session, you can use this time to uh, raise your hand. Harold will call on you uh, and um, offer his, his best answer. Um, there's also a hand raise button icon in Zoom. If you know how to use that, you can do that or you can do it the old fashioned way. I'll keep an eye out for some hands going up. Um, let's see. I'll be sending over some more information about Harold and about his organization to the chat box. This will include a donation link. Harold is providing all of these sessions for free. Therefore, any donations are greatly appreciated uh, and they're tax deductible, which is an extra bonus. These donations go to funding uh, Canticorum Virtuosi Inc., which is Harold's non for profit, um, in which he supports both of his New York based choirs. In the chat box, you will also find my email address. You can use that email or the chat box on Zoom if you're having any sort of technological troubles that you need assistance with, and I can try and help you. Lastly, we'll be recording this session like we do each session, uh, and we'll be sending you a link for you to view and review this session whenever you would like. Um, this link will also have access to our previous um, session. Um, and so feel free to, to look through those uh, at your leisure. We hope you enjoy this wonderful lecture tonight. And Harold, go ahead. Okay, welcome. You'll notice I have a different background uh, than usual. I'm actually less than a half a mile from the border of Canada. I'm in Potsdam, uh, ready for my vaccination shot tomorrow morning with my wife. So we're in a hotel um, and hopefully it won't snow too much more so we can actually get there. It's only about a mile away. So um, uh, despite what uh, it said in the press release by my wonderful um, uh, publicist, I have not conducted this many times, but I have, I did conduct this once about, I don't know, six or seven years ago. Uh, it's, uh, it was written for the Christmas season of 1734 and it actually incorporates music from earlier compositions, including some secular cantatas. Well, that's nothing new. I mean, you know, many composers have done that. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's even a book, a book by Bach on Bach called Bach the Borrower. And like one third of his music is borrowed from himself or other, you know, other uh, composers. Uh, this oratorio is in six parts. It's actually six different cantatas each intended for performance on one of the major feast days of the Christmas period. Um, so I actually performed this, you know, in, in its entirety. And I think there's enough variety. 
to make it work. It's three hours long, but it was a lot of fun. Uh, I should also say I'm not primarily a musicologist. I don't have a degree in musicology, but uh, as you can imagine, any serious conductor will study um, you know, the, what's, what's proper. And of course there are ever changing guidelines when a new book comes out or you know, for, for a book that you might've used in, in 1967, like as I did at Queens College, uh, Thurston Dart was the, compo was the author the interpretation of music, um, but things change. You know, there are new discoveries, new trends, uh, not trends, but new uh, concepts of what went on. My point is that um, there's a lot to interpret here and you have to do it in a certain style that seems to be what Bach intended. And of course, we all listen and watch Nicholas Harnoncourt and, you know, some of the early music specialists and uh, I, I had the pleasure of going to Carnegie Hall last year and seeing uh, John Elliott Gardner conduct with his Baroque orchestra, some Beethoven symphonies. So you learn what seems right and what are the modern think what's the modern thinking about certain things. So having said that, um, let me go to the very beginning. Oh, let's get the score up. We have the score. Um, now this is. What if this is from what cpdl.org? Do we know? Vocals? Yes, exactly. So is this a reprint of like, you know, uh, of a a published piece? Is this a? We don't. I don't know. I don't. Think I think this. I can. I'll do some research. I'll get back to you. Yeah, I mean, this doesn't look like something somebody just put together. Who somebody like you know, as you know, on CPDL, anybody can put the music and edit it, but. It doesn't much matter. It does matter in a sense because you don't want crescendos, decrescendos, and you know, allegro ma non troppo. That's not something Bach would have done. So this seems, you know, correct. I, I'm looking at the Baron Rider edition uh, in front of me, and it does have. It doesn't have any dynamic at the beginning. I see what you're looking at has a forte, but I don't know how to answer that except if you look at the music itself. Dun, 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 dun. You know, it, it seems very bright and uh, optimistic and joyful. So the shout ye exultant this day of salvation, yaukset, froloket. The first thing I want to say is, well, let's talk about for a moment, uh, you know, the orchestra and chorus setup, uh, just for a moment, because I want right, to get to the score, but in general, in general, you want to have your basso continuo theme very close together. So if you have a portative organ, um, some pieces you'll have a harpsichord and portative organ, but let's let's just say for a moment it's a small organ and of course the cello should sit next to the organ, uh, organ player, organist, so that when they have recitatives they can communicate with each other. Um, that's very important. Okay, anyway, uh, just go back to the actual opening of the movement for a second before the chorus comes in. Uh, as a choral conductor, now I did start, con as I said, I only conducted this once, but I did the St. John Passion, I don't know, five times, I believe, the same uh, B minor mass, three or four times. Um, so, and you know, I even started doing Passions of Bach in, in the third year of my career, back in 1976, I believe. So um, I got the experience of working with orchestras right from the beginning, and I would have had the good fortune to work and hiring many times, many times. I would say 40 times over the decades, uh, members of the St. Luke Orchestra of St. Luke's. So boarded, they knew what they were doing. And I would meet with the uh, concert mistress, one of the two founders of the orchestra of St. Luke's, Louise Schulman. Um, actually, she wasn't the concert mistress. She was one of the viola players. But I would meet with her to talk about bowings. Not every measure, like not something like this, but um, not every measure, but she had suggestions and she taught me a lot about the bowings. And it was her job. She took the, on that job of, I gave her all the parts, the orchestral parts, and she would mark the bowings in, up bow or down bow, you know? and also accent marks and things like that. 
we'd come to an agreement, we'd discuss it. And then when you conduct the orchestra, my youth, I, can, I, I tended to conduct the chorus, um, my chorus is more than I paid attention to the, um, to the orchestra players, thinking that they were solid professionals and they could interpret on their own, you know, and they pretty much did, except I think looking back, it would have been better if I just leaned in and just kind of shaped them even more. So that's really important. Um, Cause you know, you, you want, I hear some background noise. I'm not sure what that is. Yes, just everyone in mind to keep yourself muted unless you you have a question actively. Yeah, I still hear somebody. Okay, thank you, thank you, it's gone now. Yeah, so if you want to shape the choir, also shape the orchestra when it, when the choir is not, not singing and, and interludes and things like that. Okay, now how do you do the opening? Is it is it legato? Is it staccato? Is it a mixture? Um, usually it's the text that uh, tell uh, that tells me. So let's go to the text. It's the same music basically. It starts you know measure one with the is timpani boom boom boom. But now the chorus comes in and I'm seeing five notes. I'm not seeing any indication of the style. Um, I like to say that in general, let's say more than 50% of the time, maybe 70 or 80% of the time in general, in all of choral music, you wanna think that um, it's legato. It seems to be legato. That's the default, uh, but right away here, this can't be legato. I mean, I'll show you other movements that, that are, that can be. So I sing this, because as you know, those of you who've been, been attending, I sing through every single line of every single piece before I, and I put marks in. That's the only way to learn a piece and to interpret a piece. So how do I know how this should go? I just feel it. I don't, I don't want them to go, Yog said for look at. That seems a little, bit, a little bit lugubrious, even at a fast tempo. Do I want it to be all staccato or accented? Let's try all staccato. Soprano part. Now set pro look. Nah, it doesn't seem to work for me. All accented. Now set pro look. Well, not not really. But so I come up. Not so much. I come up with. I just without even thinking. Uh, it seemed. I just come. I came up with the following, and it seemed to work. You lean on the first note. It's the first beat of the measure, obviously, but um, I put a horizontal line in, which means it's a slight accent. But more importantly, look what I'm doing. Every note except a third was staccato. Why? I can't tell you why. It just seems right. Next phrase. Pure, fewer staccato as well. You can't really have staccatos, you know, on 16th notes, pretty much, you can't really, I mean, you could, but that, that doesn't make any sense to me. But the first and last notes are the only ones that seem to be staccato for me. How prize do you tag, tag? And notice GE, the last note is, is shortened. It's just, it doesn't make sense to me. How prize do you tag? Like a full eighth note, doesn't make sense. So that's the kind of thinking that goes into uh, studying scores. The, the next uh, line, measure 89, 39. Yeah, sir. To me, that's to, both of staccato and then fro lo get. Again, F-R-O, which was the only note in the opening phrase. You don't have to move anything right there on the top of the page, a third note. It's the same three, you know, same three notes. It's fro, same three rhythms accompanied by the same uh, words. Frolocke, frolocke, right. So, it, you know, there's a sense of unity and unifying element when, um, when you come up with an idea and then parts of the idea, you know, are shown later on, like, let's look at letter B. Yep, yep, said frolocke, dun, 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 and yeah, scroll down. Okay. So that's, uh, yeah, that, those are my thoughts there. And then of course you have to put, scroll down even more if you would. Now you are there. Um, breath marks, you know. Um, <coughs> of course, you, I put breath marks in. 
I mean, Bach is very well known for not caring about the voice <laughs> in a sense, um, and certainly not putting in breath marks. Well, you might say, well, doesn't a comma, okay, how many of you, um, don't, you don't have to raise your hand or anything, but I'm sure that a whole bunch of you have, especially if you're a, a choral conductor, have heard the singers raise their hand and they say, should I breathe after all commas or does a comma mean that you breathe? Well, my answer is always most of the time, but not all the time, maybe even only 55 or 60% of the time. And therefore, don't think that you breathe after a, breath, a, a, a comma in the text and measure 44 proves it. How can you possibly breathe after the sopranos and tenors after the third note? Okay, oh, that's crazy. Right, so you gotta you gotta come up with breath marks and put the marks in the score ahead of time, you know, uh, and put put marks in your score, scan it, send it to everybody, have them print the music out. Except, um, I again I don't do that with a published score without having them uh, buying the score first, and then they have the option of transferring their marks into their physical score or else just printing out my markings. So I have a breath mark in 47 after well, there, there it's pretty obvious. Um, okay, so that, those are some of the ideas. Um, and then uh, as far as Christian, yeah. I looked it up. This is uh, the man that did this edition is one of the um, main people that does, that does the box um, from the Peters edition. So it's oh, a pretty, okay. yeah, pretty, I would say, uh, well-known yeah. um, addition. Yeah, good. And no, but notice he doesn't put these expression marks in that, you know, that, that should be left to the conductor. I mean, if you want to buy a score with, you know, the editor's markings in it, that's, that's your choice. I mean, I remember so many years ago, many of you probably remember David Randolph who conducted what, the Masterworks Chorus in New York. He would do the annual Messiahs. He'd do like seven performances of the, of the Messiah. He once said to me, Harold, you know how many times I've conducted the Messiah? 144 times. Nice, David. Um, if that's what you wanna do, that's, that's good. Uh, but anyway, he was a lovely man and he um, edited uh, lagrime dal sepolcro al what is it called uh, al tomba de, you know that that book of six madrigals by Monteverde, and uh, there's a, a published version where he edited edited it like crazy, and I love his edits. I mean, I agree with ninety nine percent of everything he put into the music, but you know that's just that's a rare thing to have a, a baroque a piece from the Baroque period published with so many editor editorial markings in. In that particular case, I, I just love what he did. Um, we, we actually have a question on measure 44, Harold, if you don't yeah. mind. No. Um, this is regarding the basses and altos having a eighth note on uh, Kep while on the second beat while the um, sopranos and tenors are doing some running eighth notes. It says, um, how does he want altos and basses to lengthen cats on their eighth note? No, no. And I'll tell you why. Um, and we've talked about this in the past. Every line has the, their independent uh, essence. Now, having said so, having said that, in other words, you go through each line and you sing it. The way I hear measure 43 and 44 and 45 is here's the alto part. No, let me do that again. I just hear it that way. So the basses obviously will have the same number of staccatos in the same places. And just because uh, the tenor and soprano are doing something different doesn't mean the others should fall in line with it somehow. No, it, it, it would lose they would lose their independence and integrity if you did that, especially with Bach. I mean, if you look at, let's say, Zinger den Han by Bach, or you know any of the motets, some of the motets more than others, sometimes, uh, or the cantata movements will have three different dynamic levels, 
simultaneously because one line is brought out and one should be more subservient. Right. Um, and then in measure 67, oh, well, let's look at measure 50, five zero. So, okay, there are, there's a trill mark there. So if this was sung one and apart or with a small professional chorus, I might say, I might say go for it. La, altos, la, la, I can't, I can't do it. La, you know, I can't really do it very well, but you know, how, it's, it might be sloppy. And, it, and uh, how, can, how can four or six singers do a trill exactly together? And I don't think really that Bach intended trills to be done except with a soloist, one and a part. But, you know, again, I'll leave that to musicologists, but if it were uh, a slower cantata, a slow cantata, like, like uh, 106, go to side is the alabaster side, God's time is the best time. There are movements, where, where you're going? Well, there, are, there are movements where um, it's very slow and uh, a, a trill is, you know, sung by a soloist and it could be very moving. Um, and then finally, and then I'll go to the next movement because I don't want to spend 45 minutes on one movement. Look at measure 68. So I have um, 68, right? I have, you know, day crescendo. Like it's important to, um, if you're working with an, an amateur chorus, a college group, you know, young, young people especially, it's important to um, put little day crescendos. Like the sopranos would normally Sing clog, clog. They, they would come down in volume because the pitch goes down. The altos don't. The altos and tenors have the same pitch. So there's a chance they might go clog, clog, because there's a breath there. Well, even if there weren't a breath there, they might sing G E with the same weight as K L A because they don't know any better. It's clog, it's not clog. But especially when there's a breath, and it's fast, the tendency for a very amateur group to go clog, you know, because they want to take a very quick breath so they'll accent the note right before the breath. So I would put a decrescendo in the upper three parts and for the bass, you know, a decrescendo from beat two to beat three, just to, you know, help them out, help them out. All right, let's look at the, um, the recitative following this. So the first, oh, well, first of all, oh, yeah, gotta keep going. Go to, uh, stop before the recitative. Let me go, let's go one, yeah. Notice it at stop capo. So it's a very long first movement. Um, and he doesn't have a retardando. Bach never put R-I-T, so it's up to you. So um, I'm gonna sing the soprano part from 197. <laughs> Notice I started slowing down like you know three measures before the end. Um, that's pretty important to do, I think. Not all the time. You just have to figure out when when that should happen. And I think coming especially into a fermata, which this isn't, but especially into a fermata or, or the very end. Uh, hold on, I'm in a hotel room. Hold on one second. Yes. Oh, no, thanks. Just leave it there. Thanks. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> um, you want to slow down. And then, you know, the question is, what do you do after the last note? You pause. Pause and go back. You pause. Okay. Then after you get to the fine, you have the rich tattoo. So, um, as you know, well, I'm looking at a, a, a vocal score and so are you. So I would imagine since you have all these sustained notes that this is with uh, strings. Um, some of you may have a full score there. I don't remember what it is. So this, but it looks like it's, uh, yeah, looks like it's with accompaniment, orchestral accompaniment. It's bassoon, uh, organ uh, and continual. So that's just, well, that's just, uh, yeah. So that's a recitative secco. Thanks, Rick. 
Um, so I don't know when it was, maybe the 1980s when people were realizing that um, rich tatives, in rich tatives like this, you play the chord and you don't have to sustain it like on the organ, for example, or play arpeggios if you're on the harpsichord, but rather you strike the chord and you disappear. And the singer goes, da, 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 and it keeps singing without accompaniment. Right? Then when the chord changes, the continuo team makes their presence felt again. Um, well, since this is not with orchestra, my main point here is that I like, personally, I like to have the continuo team watch me before they begin. Watch me bring them in, just for my own, just the way I'd like it paced, the whole piece paced. So the first movement ended, and then I bring them in, and I disappear. I don't do anything. You don't conduct recitatives unless the orchestra is playing. But can anybody think of a... a any reason why I'd want to wait more than a few seconds uh, before I bring I start the recitative? I might even wait a full minute. That seems ridiculous. Why might that be? So the soloist could walk in front. Good point. Good point. But you know the thing is, the soloist should really be sitting right there or just standing up, you know? But, you, but you, you're on the right track, Joseph. And it's called, it's one word, latecomers. <laughs> right? Otherwise, what are you gonna do? Let them come in after the first of six cantatas? Let them wait 30 minutes out there? All right, let's go on. So um, I also like to well, let me just say that continuo players don't like it, I, I think, when th they have to look at the conductor to start. They're so good, they're so highly trained. They don't need me to, to start them, but I just like to pace it myself. Um, now, the transition from the end of this recitative to, which is sung by, yeah, which is sung by a tenor to um, uh, the next one, wait a minute. No, go back go back to the section, let me see, I have a different score. Okay, different edition. So my mine at, at the end of 19, let me see what you have, hold on. Oh, I see, I see what you have. Okay, so now, um, yeah, we scroll down just a time, but keep, keep the, that's it, keep recitative on top, the word, and scroll down a little bit more, okay. Now you have, from a tenor, you have an alto, but here it is a componiato. You can see even in your score, the oboe d'amore comes in. Um, so here you want to start conducting, but exactly where do you, you know, how do you, where do you pick up the baton? Where do you start conducting? So in my score, I have a bracket, which is an indication for me to conduct already right before the first note that you're looking at on the page, even though it's part of a, a phrase which wasn't conducted. He goes, das, das sollte, right? So on sollte, so, the very first word, uh, word you're looking at, I conduct, I go, sollte, um, and I treat, I treat, well, in my score, after the AG sharp in the accompaniment, it's a whole different page and it's a whole different measure. I mean, it's the, it's the third and fourth beats of that measure on a different page. But the point is, the main point is, you, you know, you want to set the tempo. Obviously, you have to. You're bringing the orchestra in. So he's singing, he's singing, he's singing. I'm not doing anything. And then I go, I go, so, boom. But then I keep conducting. Now, the, the alto soloist might, might want to, I mean, it is a recitative, but if it's accompaniato, there's a little less freedom for the singer, you know, to linger or stretch or speed up or whatever, um, because there's a conductor and, and an orchestra and they have to basically do a 4-4, four, four, you know, a 4-4 four, four, uh, feeling and, and stay, to get, stay together. 
okay, the very end of this, of the recitative, um, there might be a chance here for, for me to, to do a, a, a subdivision. Um, it depends how much retard you want. So let me just sing the line. Ah, notice I put a, an A there on VI, W-E-I, because it's pretty standard, uh, pretty well known that when you have a, in the recitative, especially at the end, you have like a third down that you like, like B and two G sharps, you're really supposed to go, fill it in with a stepwise motion, substitute an A, a G sharp with an A, but then let me go on. I might subdivide the second B. If I'm slowing down a lot. Even if I'm not slowing down that much, I might go. You know, that every time there's a retard with some fast moving notes, you want to make a decision ahead of time whether you're going to subdivide or not and tell them. And when you subdivide, let me just do a, a physical technique kind of thing. You know, you don't want to go one and two and so it's two and the and should be smaller. One, two and not one, two and. You don't want to fling your arms around like that. If, if you're subdividing a whole piece or a whole movement, and you know, like the Mozart Requiem opening, right? Before the before the chorus comes in on one and two and three and notice the ands are all smaller. If you're conducting eight eight, that's different. That's very rare. Eight eight. I I know Stravinsky has it. Maybe written many other composers, but it's pretty rare. Okay, so now we're in the first aria. When I meet with soloists, I always ask them what tempo they like. And chances are that it'll be fine with me. Who am I to tell a soloist who has worked their butts off to, to, to learn something beautifully that they should do it faster or slower? I'm the conductor, that's who I am. And I have the right to do that. And sometimes I suggest that you know, I'll, I'll say that's that's good, but can we try it? You know, I try to be like very collegial. And I know some conductors just just don't do that or haven't in the past. They don't ask the, the soloist anything. They'll just start the orchestra, and that's it. But I I just don't like to do that. Uh, and every every soloist is is different. I mean, some tempos work well in somebody's voice and not so well in somebody else's voice. I don't even. Um, put in breath marks. I don't even suggest breath marks. Why should I bother? Don't, don't you think the soloist has worked that out himself or herself? The only time I suggest breath marks and do more than suggest breath marks is when there are duets or trios. And especially when there's a homophonic section, for example, where you really don't want somebody, one person breathing in at one point and two others breathing at another point when they really should all breathe together or not breathe at all. So uh, yeah, now, um, you know, look, some, I'm sure there are a lot of you who pronounce German better than I do, but just a few tips about the German. Um, you know, every, every word that begins with a vowel should be approached with a glottal stop. Um, you should roll R's as much as possible as much as you can, not just initial R's. A lot of people can't roll R's. I can't roll R's, I physically can't roll R's. That's why I'm not an opera singer because I can't roll R's and my voice really sucks. Other than that, I could have been a great opera singer, but uh, can't roll R's. And um, yeah, yeah, the leicht see on. Okay, a couple of little pointers. As far as um, you know, interpreting, again, you leave that to the soloist, but when you're working with a young person, it's good to point out certain basic fundamentals, you know, like uh, 
For example, at the very opening, I mean, the word is bereite, bereite. That's the first word. Well, a high school student is not going to go, you know, 99% of high school students, or even maybe, maybe like 80% of college students are not going to go, they're going to go, they see a triad, second inversion, but they see a da da da, and they're going to go da 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 instead of dun tia dun dun tia. So you tell them it's a waltz. I like to say every piece in three quarter time is a waltz, even though that's not true. I mean, in other words, it's dance like. Now here, here too, um, I don't, I don't see that second note in measure twenty-five as being a full eighth note. Well, I can't see. I'm getting a, a post cataract treatment as soon as this pandemic's over because the things are a little glazed over here. Uh, so it's insurance and yeah, staccato. Why not? Ten leaps and it's a nice feeling to have this, you know, um, lilting flavor to it throughout. If you listen to the great singer, listen to Dietrich Fischer Discow, of course he's long gone, but man, uh, well, there are so many, so many great singers we can learn from, how expressive they are. And again, I, I tell my singers, sing it the way you would speak it. And that's not always the case, but that's a good rule, you know? Um, okay, let's go on to the, the first chorale. Movement five, and so there's very little guidance, you know. But let the let the words. I mean, you must let the words uh, rule and influence your interpretation. So, how can I fitly greet thee? How rightly thee extol? How can I praise you? And, Oh Lord Jesus, I pray thee carry the torch to light my way. Okay, seems to me to be mezzo forte. It just seems that way to me. Um, now that doesn't mean the whole the whole chorale is mezzo forte or any whole chorale. For example, look at the uh, look at the end of it. Scroll down, the B section. Oh Jesus, Jesus. And then uh, we we'll pick up to measure nine, da mit. Um, that I, I mean, it's not an exact translation I have here, that I may know thy pleasure and serve thee day by day. That's not, I'm looking at the German, that's not a very good interpretation, but it's probably sort of close in feeling. My point is, that look at the third to the last measure. I have a big day crescendo from Gert to Se. And then I have in my mind, I have that the final phrase should be mezzo piano. Anybody have the actual translation of that? Anybody really good in German? Mir kund und wissen sei. Um, if not, I'll just say, it's mezzo piano, and then I have them decrescendoing in the last measure to the very last note being piano. It just, there's no reason you have to do chorales in, you know, one way, one dynamic and all that. Now, um, um, yeah. We have another question about, about chorales. Um, do you ever skip over some of the fermatas to keep things moving? Yeah. I was just about to mention that. Absolutely. I, I mean, we know now that they're not really intended to be held. It's not. It's not. It's not to keep things moving. That's not the reason we do it. The reason we do that. I remember maybe 25, 30 years ago when suddenly, you know, these Baroque scholars started saying, you know, the fermatas really should not be held. Uh, it, I mean, I think it came from the tradition of, of cantatas, you know, being performed in. Box Church with him leading them. 
and there are fermatas throughout the, uh, the cor final chorales, which were 99% oh, oh, of the time based on uh, tunes from the hymnal that everybody knew, but the whole congregation sang along in the final chorales. And so to keep them together, they put fermata signs so that those who lingered will catch up and those who rushed will slow down. But on having said that, there are some fermatas I just feel should be kept in. In this particular corral, none, <laughs> except the last one. But you know, throughout the cantatas and the passions, there are, you know, you, just, you have you have a choice. I feel to hold some and not others. Uh, yeah, okay. Then the recitative comes. Um, here's an interesting. Let's look at number seven. Soprano and bass. So the soprano, um, this is with oboes, oboe d'amore, one and two, and continuous. So you really have to conduct this. Absolutely. This is not a seco. Uh, yeah, are you at the beginning there? Yeah, that's good. So you have to conduct it. So I think one prep gesture is good enough because it's on Dante three. Dun, 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 By the way, uh, you have a choice of doing these pieces a half step down, A415 most likely, or A440. There are pros and cons to doing that. Uh, if you want to make it really authentic or more authentic, you would want to lower the pitch, but we know that it wasn't always 415, it changed from city to city. If you have people with perfect pitch, it drives them crazy to look at a, an A and hear an A flat. So that might be a consideration. Um, anyway, let's go to the corral. So see here, the trill, I mean, most soloists would put that trill in. I, I believe the, Way, the right way to do it is to start on the upper note. Something like that. Now, the question is, how do you, uh, as a conductor, how do you transition into um, the bass entrance, uh, which is still, uh, even though you don't see any changing notes in measure 17, it still has to be conducted. It's still, it's not seco. It's not seco. So you have to keep conducting. But my one thing I want to point out here is in measure, measure 16 going to 17, I feel the need to slow down just a bit, to linger, to do a rubato, not necessarily a retardando. But in measure 16, he goes, she goes, well, I'll sing her whole line. One and two and three and one. Notice I slowed down on the third beat. I didn't subdivide because the retard was a slight one. Um, I, sort of akin to the, uh, in a sense, in the very, I'm um, stretching this a bit, but in the Verdi Requiem, in the Kyrie, in the opening movement, where each uh, soloist comes in one at a time, the first, very first entrance in the Verdi. Um, right before the next entrance, the next soloist comes in. Every, each, each time, I feel the need to slow down a little bit. Why? I can't tell you, but you know, some box should be absolutely metronomic and and others shouldn't shouldn't be i guess some of you may know more about this than i do or have listened but it seems to me somebody like glenn gould would take you know more rubatos than perhaps other pianists um yeah, and then you're going from a recitative into a really strict non-recitative andante. So again, I I have the need. Well, no, scroll up still. Scroll back. Um, yeah, right there, the andante at letter A. 
right before it. So the bass goes, I feel the need not to plow ahead metronomically, but just to linger on fear. Let me get a C. Yeah, give a little bit of a preparation to the to the fact that it's now a steady tempo for the following on Dante, right? And that stays that way. So each time, and then again, back to where it says recitative in measure 29, I feel the need to slow down, might be on the third beat. Dun, 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 dun. It's, there's a nice sort of, a, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it, but there's something nice about doing that, protecting each segment, isolating each, pointing out certain things before and after each segment. Um, okay. Dun, dun. So the next, let's let's look at another choral movement. I know we can't spend three hours on this, but uh, okay, number nine. And watch that. Watch that word that right before the rests Jesu line. Jesu line. Which probably means you know little Jesus. I don't know tender Jesus, child Jesus, but it's one word. So, again, you have your average choral society, where Myrna is sitting next to Sidney, and Josephine, and they're having a great old time, and uh, and they're singing. The sopranos go, without without your guidance, they go. Ach, mein Herz, liebes Jesu line, which is crazy. Just because the line rises up does not mean you should accent L-E-I-N. That's crazy because you would, that's not singing it the way you'd speak it. Jesu line. That's absolutely crazy. Now, I mean, look at the bass part. Again, rank amateurs are going to go, Jesu line. They're going to relax into the last note. How can you have them relax into the last note and the sopranos go higher and go louder? And especially when you go Jesu line and your mouth flies open for the L-A-H, la, your mouth flies open. So the tendency is to sing louder. So it's, it's up to you as the conductor to put a decrescendo. I would put a decrescendo on the first beat because the way you would speak this is Jesu line. So the second note, the second word, the second syllable is softer than the first, and the third syllable is softer than the second. It's very clear to me how I would do this. And the same thing with the next phrase. Beta line. Beta line. Right. Same thing. Well, here, okay, here, here three out of the four parts go down. The tenors don't. So the tenors would go beta line. So no, keep them in check and write these things in. Uh, uh, look at measure 12. Here's a, a chance for something I call a, a hairpin on the, in the alto part. A little crescendo and, and followed by a little decrescendo on the dotted quarter note. It's a nice expressive element. Um, instead of accenting G-E-S, you just you have them crescendo on it, which highlights it in a very different way. Okay. Are there any questions? We have to pretty much stop. We have about 10 more minutes. Yeah. Are there any questions though? It doesn't have to be specifically about this piece. It can be uh, because, you know, really, I mean, the things I'm talking about apply to 99% of all other pieces written whether it's Baroque or Renaissance or modern music, you don't want to accent the wrong syllable. You want to be expressive unless you think it shouldn't be expressive. For example, people might say, well, maybe Poulenc and Stravinsky wrote that way because they didn't want to have excess emotion. You know, the, they want to keep their emotion in check. And maybe that's correct. Um, you know, if you look at Pater Noster or by Stravinsky or Ave Maria by Stravinsky. You can do that in a very straightforward manner. He wasn't, um, 
you know, the most expressive composer like, uh, like Rachmaninoff, for example. But, and yet, I don't know how many of you know the mass, uh, Stravinsky mass for eight instruments and, uh, and chorus. And, you know, and he puts in staccatos and, you know, it's very, uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Well, besides non, non espressivo cut and dry, you know, that's, that's Stravinsky. But if you look at the Agnus Dei of that mass, which is, I, I look at that and I say, this is tender and lyrical and, and wants to have all these beautiful tender moments in it. it it's very hard to do that non, on, you know, non espressivo. Mm -hmm. Um I have uh, a question, Harold, uh, yeah. and please, uh, I hope this is interesting for anyone else, but in terms of programming, like if you have a, um, an amateur or even semi-amateur choir and you want to do parts of this chorale, or sorry, parts of this oratorio, um, I find, you know, if, if everyone ever wants to do segments of larger oratorios, it's always part one. Is there any exception to that rule where you can, um, you know, program different different sections that aren't just going in order in that sense? Like, could you ever just do part two? Could you ever do part three uh, in your personal opinion? Well, in this particular piece, it was never done all together as one. They right. Were, so, he, he, so um, I mean, I like to challenge myself and do, you know, long concerts. Uh, and like I said last week, I did 11 Bach cantatas in one day. Uh, so I like to challenge myself. But um, you can do one, two, or three of these um, uh, cantatas separately, not cantatas, uh, whatever they're called. Uh, yeah, cantatas separately uh, and short. Sure, probably most of the time people don't do all six together. Right. As, far as, as far as like the Bach motets, um, you don't have to do them chronologically. They were written for six, di six different occasions and and I tend to uh, rearrange them so they're not chronological, but make more sense. Look, you can do anything, especially with Bach, and everything has been done with Bach, from switched on Bach. You know, I mean, the way I learned Bach, I, I learned, I first heard Bach when the Swingle singers sang Bach. So they jazzed it up. That was my introduction to Bach. And it, I mean, you can't do anything with Bach to ruin it. Um, I went to my conducting teacher, Paul Maynard, and I, I had him listen to a recording of the Swingle Singers, and he was, a, he was an albino. He had very trouble, a lot of trouble seeing, uh, he was almost blind, and I, I like to say he's, he, turned, he turned white when he <laughs> heard that, and he said, what, what is this? You know, he was already <laughs> as white as you can be. Anyway, so I loved Bach like, that way, um, and look, as I said last week, I'm doing over the next two seasons, I'm doing 15 concerts of, of all, the, all the cantata movements with piano. So I don't care what the critics say, I wanna do it. I, will, I wanna do that. I don't know if I've answered your question. Um, you can do anything. I mean, you can do, you can do an aria from, uh, if you're a singer, you can program an aria from an oratorio. I, I guess maybe just as a, as a, as a piggyback, what would your, what would your, if you could only do one section of this piece, part one, part two, or part three, which one would you want to program? Well, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> I, have to, I have to look at it. You know, I, okay. as I tell people in these truth and nine sessions, I don't, I don't come prepared. I don't, I don't, look, I didn't look at this since seven years ago. So I'm just, because I want it to be fresh in my mind. I have my markings in it and I want to look at it sort of like, I'm looking at it for the first time and thinking what to do, you know. Right. So I do remember that I do remember that there were fantastic uh, movements all throughout the three hour hours long. It's not like the passions, which you cannot do. You cannot do a segment of the Saint John Passion. You can cut down the Saint Matthew. I've done that. I did the Saint Matthew twice, and I cut. Maybe Joseph sang in one of them. I don't know. Did you? Did you sing? Oh, you you sang in the the. Uh, two thousand two thousand two. Wow. Does that sound right? Spring twenty. Spring uh, two thousand two. I did one with the Westchester Oratorio in. Right. Uh, Rye and and we left out a lot, um, of the arias. You know, it's, but uh, you, so. But you can't. 
you can't put down the St. John Passion, you know, you can't stop just when he's about to be, uh, you know, whatever. Right. Um, I think Bruce might have had a question. Uh, yes, a question and a comment. A comment is that, uh, Harold, your best advice tonight is sing it as you speak it. And my advice and uh, question is that how many people here can read German? Bitte Deutsch lernen. It's really great to hear this piece and work on this piece if you know German. When I lived in Germany two years, it was such a new world to suddenly hear this piece and understand every word in the recitatives and the arias and appreciate what was going on. And to the previous question about doing the six movements, a suggestion if you like to be liturgically correct, the six parts, the first three are the th first three days of Christmas. So if you're doing it in a church concert, you could do in the first three days of Christmas, cantata one, two, and three. And then and the Sunday after New Year's is the fourth cantata. And the fifth cantata, or no, the fourth one is for the uh, circumcision of Christ festival. The fifth one is the Sunday after New Year's. And then what six is this fatal day now we think with January 6th, Epiphany, oh, yeah. which is the real meaning of January 6th. Thank you. Anyway, I really appreciate your saying you think about the words, but it helps if you know what the words mean. And then yes. you get the accentuation and you also understand the great orchestral accompaniments that go with this that imply things when the oboe d'amore comes in and the first recitative is the first allusion to this Virgin Mary is suddenly she's pregnant. And that, that first accompanying recitative you talked about is a special moment when the first mention of a pregnant Virgin Mary, it's, it comes in the, in the cantata and Bach added a mo, a bo's, obo what? Obo d'amore. Right. Well, it's, it's kind of ironic. <laughs> yeah, right. The virgin birth. <laughs> right, right. It's sort of like uh, in the same Matthew, every time Jesus sings the strings playing, uh, representing a halo, tell us, give us a 15 second uh, summary of, of your bio. Bruce, I met Bruce when he was the chair of the music department at Brooklyn College. I want to correct you that there, there is, there's no separation between performers and musicologists. I'm okay. a performer, singer, choral person. I've directed the, many of these choruses in this, in this uh, work. Uh, I'm a musicologist by doctoral training at uh, the Graduate Center of CUNY, did my master's at Stony Brook. I taught for 35 years at Brooklyn College, where I taught music history and directed choruses and, uh, and enjoying retirement now, working on some editions of some other choral pieces. So why, that's interesting. So why do you say there's no difference? Because a, really a conductor should really know the things that, that are studied and you get degrees for, but I mean, musicologists know a lot more than conductors in, in that in his, uh, historical sense, but conductors know a lot more, generally speaking about how to, how to conduct the musicologist, but interweaving is the best solution, right? Well, not every performer can be Joshua Rifkin, but they should try to be like Joshua Rifkin, who tried to learn everything about Bach and try different things and, and keep exploring. And not just to, you know, do the way you feel at the moment, but you can also use your knowledge and use your experiences, such as you right. have from many years right. of conducting. So, uh, right. but a musicologist is, is, was originally a music scholar, but it, it, was, it, did, it did not exist at the time of Bach, it did not exist at the time of Brahms. I mean, they were just- well, that's interesting, that's so, interesting. Uh, yeah. It's terrible that they, they you get this division between musicologists and performers. Every yeah. performer should strive to know everything they can about the music they're performing. Right. That's what we musicologists try to in inculcate. <laughs> well, speaking of Joshua Rifkin, I mean, uh, he. it seems like a lot of people accepted his notion that a lot of these works, or most of them were done one and a part, and he actually presented the B minor mass with one and a part. I don't know, it doesn't, it doesn't move me to hear like the Magnificat or the B minor mass with one and a part, I don't know. I'm not advocating the gospel according to Joshua Rifkin. <laughs> Everybody should know that Bach, Beethoven, Haydn, Mozart, these were practical musicians and you do what works. And if you need to add a double bass to the cello in a recitative accompaniment to make it heard in a hall, you add it, don't you, Harold? Right, absolutely. If the basso continuo is weak, add a double bass. 
you listen and you work with the acoustics, you don't think there's one way to perform it. Right. It's flexible. And speaking of that, I've had a lot of experience, again, working with Louise, uh, Louise Schulman, uh, the co-founder of the Orchestra of St. Luke's along with Michael Spearman, I believe. Um, with this, just that kind of thing, like she would suggest, you know, like even only one time in a two hour long oratorio, she said, you know, I think instead of cello, let's have a bassoon play with the harpsichord or the or, or organ. It depends on the text and the mood. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Any other questions? We, yes, any last minute questions uh, to wrap us up here tonight? Now, next week we're doing Mendelssohn's Elijah. Yep. I had the great pleasure of I, every every piece I'm presenting, I've conducted every piece on these Tuesday night sessions, had the great pleasure of working with somebody you may not have ever heard of, uh, a great baritone named David Arnold, who I've had the great pleasure of hiring literally 35 times or so over three decades. And he sang Elijah from memory. And when he opened his mouth in, at the piano you know, rehearsal with me, to sing the opening, I started shaking and tears started. I mean, he was so powerful an interpreter, uh, but it's a great, great piece. Um, and you, yeah, go ahead. Corinne. Oh, I was just reminding you to, to um, talk about the choral clinics that will be coming up after uh, yeah, we our next week. Session. We have six weeks in a row after that, where uh, just like last week when we had four singers and four professional, four young singers and four professional singers who I hired to give comments. I see one of them there, Ivory. Um, we're gonna have, hopefully, people submitting, con choral conductors submitting tapes, videos of, of performances they've, they've conducted so that I can critique it. And uh, I'll need, yes, yeah, so spread the word. And if you have any of yourself, or if you've sung in a chorus and wanna um, send me the, video ahead of time or email me whatever but get your conductor's permission because if I rip it apart and the conductor's not happy having not get, have given permission I'm going to be very gentle about it very positive and and uh, like the singers were last week the professional singers were very positive and yeah okay the only the only stipulations are that it's um, of the classical repertoire and it's, classical. Um, it's it's under five minutes so it's and a very am, wide range. What am I going to say if somebody does pop music? I'm going to say very nice, very in tune. <laughs> I mean, I don't, you know, my specialty is classical music. I, re I did a lot of clinics for a company from the Midwest. They'd have these high school choirs come in by bus from like Detroit for three days in New York City to see a Broadway show and sing in the Cathedral of St. John the Divine and do a, a clinic with me. So they, I'd say to them, you know, only classical music and invariably they'd come with like six pieces, five would not classical. And the sixth one was Debussy with a beat. <laughs> I mean, right. So classical only, thank you. I see Patrick O'Malley, he's a wonderful composer. Raise your hand, Patrick. I did a piece of his a few years ago. Anyway, thanks everybody. Thank and you all, be safe and see you next week. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.